Good morning to you. Uh, it is uh, number 10 in our Bible studies today in the book of Genesis, in the story of Joseph. We're looking at the life of Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 to 50, and today we're at chapter 45. And we're going to be looking at the whole of Genesis chapter 45 today in our continuing series in the story of the life of Joseph. And today we're going to read Genesis chapter 45, the whole of that chapter. Hi to everyone who's joining us, whether you're from Trinity Baptist Church who are hosting this, or whether you're from uh, other churches or other places. Mia's just come in on the uh, the study. Hello Mia, Had good to have you with us. And all the others who I've been saying hello to over the last few minutes. Uh, we're going to start with a prayer and then we're going to read Genesis chapter 45 together. Let's pray. Father God, we pray as we gather together this morning that you will be with us. We pray that although we are uh, distant from one another in different places, some of us in different places throughout the world and certainly in different parts of Manchester and of Britain, we pray, Lord, that we will know your loving presence with us. We pray that as we read the Bible, you will speak to us through your word about the love and salvation that you offer to this world and that those of us who love you will know more of your compassion, your love and your control. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. OK, we're going to read the Bible together. We're going to read Genesis chapter 45. Uh, and I have the privilege of reading this to you. Please read it with me. I'll be reading from the New International Version UK edition. And whichever version you're reading from, uh, follow along, please. Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now, hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. And I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves and so can my brother Benjamin that it really is I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honour accorded me in Egypt and about everything you've seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and Benjamin embraced him weeping and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan, and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You are instructed to tell them, Do this, take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives, and get your father and come. 
Never mind about your belongings, because the, because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts, as Pharaoh had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father, ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away as they were leaving. He said to them, don't quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land Jacob and came to his father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced. My son Joseph is alive. I will go and see him before I die. This is God's word to us today. That wonderful family reunion uh, not yet complete. We're going to see more of it when Jacob comes into Egypt. But that great revelation that Joseph brings to his brothers after all this time. Just to recap, last time uh, the hero of our chapter was Judah, uh, one of Joseph's brothers who was pleading with Joseph for light of life of their brother, Benjamin. Joseph had planted a silver cup in Benjamin's bag as they were leaving with more provisions and Joseph was still holding back his true identity. That was the previous chapter, but now Joseph finally reveals who he is. After all these years and after many chapters of keeping his identity from his brothers, now it's time to confess who he is. So he sends everyone else out of the room and with much weeping and wailing, he tells the brothers the truth. This is the moment when all that hidden identity, that pent up uh, emotion through all those weeks and months of traveling backwards and forwards and, and Joseph not being able to tell them who he was or deciding not to. Now it is revealed. Now the time has come. And now this announcement has come. What follows from it? From it? Well, in verse three, the announcement starts with concern for his father. He says, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? That may seem like a strange question after Judah has told him just in the previous dialogue that uh, about the father. Your father is concerned that our father is concerned for the return of his son. Uh, in, in the in the original language, that question, is my father living, has the sense of, is he well? Is he enjoying health and well-being? Uh, Joseph's concern is is not so much for the, uh, the ten brothers. It's for Benjamin and it's for dad. Is he still in good mind? Is he still in good health? Is he still in good uh, well-being? Is he looking after himself? But we're told that the reaction of the brothers is not to answer their question that they're given. It's of terror. For them, it's not a, a, a joyful reunion. They realise all of a sudden that this man who has power over them is the man they tried to kill and sell into slavery. They are still his captives. Their first reaction is not that this is good news, but this is bad news because the man who holds them at his mercy is the one they wronged those years ago. What is he going to do to them? What are they to say to him? But Joseph is the one who takes the initiative to reassure them and says, he draws them close and he says, no, it's all right. 
And he does it not by talking about the relationship between him and them, but by speaking about God's control over this. He reassures them. He says, don't worry. This is all part of God's plan. He says, God sent him, Joseph, ahead of them, the brothers, to save lives in this time of famine. He said, this was all God's plan, that I should come to Egypt first. He doesn't mention how he comes to Egypt as a slave, having spent time in Potiphar's prison. He says, all this was part of God's plan to save lives in this time of famine. That God had been working in their lives from the very beginning. And Joseph even says that it wasn't the brothers or the Ishmaelites who'd caused Joseph to be in Egypt, but the plans of God that had brought him there. This chapter is all about plans, as we've seen plenty of little plans and plots and subplots in the previous chapters. Excuse me, get my drink. But it's God whose plan is working out now in this chapter. And now Joseph has a plan of his own to reveal. We've seen before that Joseph likes to have plans up his sleeve. I think he spends his night his nights uh, plotting and planning what will happen if this happens and what will happen if this happens. He is indeed a schemer and a dreamer. He always has some scheme ready to reveal. This time he says it's like this. This is what we're going to do. Your family will not survive the famine in Canaan. The, the famine is only going to get worse. They don't know that, of course. Uh, but Joseph does. He's been told by God all those years ago, nine years previously, that after the seven good years, there would be seven years of famine. And two of them have happened, but five are still to come. He says, if you think it's bad now in terms of famine, it's only going to get worse. But I am going to be your saviour. I'm going to give you land here in Egypt in a place called Goshen. Uh, go home, he says, get your dad, get the whole family and come and live here near to me and you'll be fine. This place, Goshen, also known as the land of Ramesses, uh, we're not 100 percent sure where it is, but we, we think that it's a land, an area to the eastern side of the Nile Delta that was a fertile place, a place for farming, a place where the family could live and resume their life of, uh, of farming. It's, it is the same place from which they uh, escape uh, all those hundreds of years later when, they, uh, when the exile happens, when the, the Hebrew people leave Egypt in the exile. There's, there's a number of parallels here, uh, sh foreshadowings here of the exile. We'll come to that later. The exodus we will come to that later. And the mention of Goshen here is the first foreshadowing of, of, of the later Exodus. Go to Goshen, he says. I've got this place for you. And this will be a place where you can settle and live. So the reunion with the brothers and especially with Benjamin seems to end well with lots of hugs and tears. That's the first half of our chapter. The second half of our chapter involves Pharaoh. Because Pharaoh hears of Joseph's plan and wants to get involved. And Pharaoh comes out of this really well. Pharaoh is generous and welcomes the plan that Joseph has devised. Pharaoh gives them uh, food and silver. The silver's not hidden this time. It has been the last two occasions in which they've set off from Egypt. And they have not just donkeys, more donkeys, but carts. Uh, the Egyptians were known for the development of, of wheeled vehicles. This would have been the new technology of the day. Uh, they've got carts for, for that the donkeys would have been pulling uh, to bring all their family back into Egypt, into Goshen. Uh, an amusing part of this, a, a little detail that's uh, in this story that uh, um, raises a smile that Joseph's parting shot to them is, is a fatherly word where he says, don't quarrel on the way. Uh, they will, after all, have a lot to talk about on their way back to dad. And they'll have to talk about the deception that they played on their dad all those years before. When they get home, they're not only going to have to tell him that Joseph is alive, 
they're going to have to tell him why they told him that Joseph was dead. They're going to have an awful lot to talk about. And these brothers have usually quarrelled, being the sons of different mothers. They've usually quarrelled and found something to fall out about. So at the end of our chapter, we find that they get home and they tell all to their elderly father, Jacob. Yes, Joseph is alive. Jacob's reaction is, is not anger against the brothers. We, we don't hear anything of that. Jacob's reaction, once he's convinced, is a simple desire to see his long lost son. And that's where we leave this chapter and where we'll go next time after another dream. Again, the person who divided this into chapters leaves us with a cliffhanger, a duff duff moment, like the best um, novels, like the best soap operas do, like the best bits of storytelling. What's going to happen next? Uh, this is less unexpected, because what's going to happen next uh, is that they are going to set off back to Egypt for the reunion. But it doesn't happen quite as smoothly as you might think. But anyway. That's our chapter. That's our chapter for today. And uh, there in chapter 45 of Genesis, we see uh, the the resolution to the thing that's been holding this relationship in tension for the last three chapters. What I want to ask, having looked into this chapter and reviewed it and, and explained some bits of it, I want to ask, how is God speaking to this to us in the passage? What can we learn of God and his ways? What can we see of importance about uh, about our God? And what can we learn of how to live for Christ in our time? What's God saying to you here? I wonder if there's anything that's leapt off the page for you as you've read this scripture today. If there is, or if there's something that just speaks to your heart, then leave some comments down here on the bottom of the page in Facebook or in YouTube if you're watching the recording of this. For me, as I read this, there were two big theological themes in this scripture that occurred to me. Things that tell us about the way our God is and the way our God works in the world. Uh, but they're not just theological themes. That sounds a bit dry and dusty. They're also things about God that speak into the personal life of faith that we live as Christian people today. So I'd like to introduce those two themes. One is uh, salvation, simple enough. But the, the first one is providence. The first one is the one, it's one we've been skirting around all through this series and I want to look at it head on today. What we call God's providence, in other words that God is in control of all things and that even when bad things happen, God's control can turn them around to good. And we see that in this passage explicitly now. We've been seeing things leading up to that, but we see it explicitly in verses five and seven, five, five, six and seven particularly. Joseph says, you sold me here, but God sent me here. To summarise those verses, Joseph said to his brothers, you sold me here, but God sent me here. What we see in, the jo in Joseph is the conviction that it was God's will not the actions of any people that controlled every event and every circumstance. For Joseph, there's a positive framework, framework, an infrastructure for this meeting that's beyond simply the actions of these men, these brothers. And that's what makes reconciliation so much easier for him and I think for them. Joseph doesn't blame the brothers for the bad times he went through because he sees God's guiding hand in everything. And he says, don't be angry with yourselves. It's a bit of a strange phrase to use, but that's how he puts it. Don't be angry with yourselves. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to save lives. Joseph sees the positive side of it, but not just in, a, in an optimistic, seeing the best in everything way. He sees the hand of God in it type way. He sees that his God is working in all that has happened. And that's what's important here. He isn't just saying, oh, isn't it jolly that everything turned out well in the end? He's not saying that. He's saying 
No, you've got to see the bigger picture here, brothers. You've got to see that God from the beginning was working through all of these actions for his own glory and purpose and for the good of all people, whether they were Hebrews or whether they were Egyptians. God is working his purpose out. God is working his goodness through the things that we have been involved with as pieces on the board, as as the, those he has control, had his controlling hand upon. And he says that that was done to save lives. Human life is, is, is precious to God. Human life matters to God. We are not simply um, playthings to God. In some, in some what we might call religious systems, human beings are seen as just, um, just the pieces that God plays with on his big board of chess, on his uh, working out of the world according to his purposes. And sometimes we might see uh, God's control of the world a bit like that. But it's not like that. God isn't the great f God of, of fatalism who says, well, it's all set up in place and God just moves the pieces around according to his, his purposes. No, it's not that. It's more that God's love and concern for us means that he pushes things in a certain direction for our good, not just for his own perverse delight, he isn't that kind of God. He does things to save lives for the good of this world, for the good of his people and for the good of his creation. When he made this world, he saw it was good and he wants to continue to see it being good. His heart is love. His motivation is, is grace and concern for each of us. He is a good God who is also a God who, is, who has control over the world. That is the difference about the God that we know, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who has been revealed to us through Jesus, is a God of power, but also a God of infinite goodness. In our lives, as people trying to follow Jesus, or perhaps you still haven't discovered this Jesus as your saviour, but I recommend that you do. He is a good and loving companion through life who saves us. In our lives as people trying to follow this way it's good to see the bigger picture that God is in control. When things go wrong, when you are sinned against, when people hurt you, when you end up feeling that the world has let you down, it's a comfort that we have a God who is in control, not that God has caused these things but that God can make good out of bad and that God still have his, has his loving hand upon you. And that overall in this world, God is still in control of the way the world is and will still act for good and will still act for the good of all people. And we need to know that when we pray. Sometimes our prayers aren't answered it doesn't mean God's not listening. It just means maybe that God knows better than we do. <laughs> you know that he does. But you know that he's good. That's what Joseph says. That's what we learn from this passage. That's what speaks into your life today. In this time of virus, this time of illness, this time of sad, sad loss of people, we can still cling on to this, that our God is good and that our God is in control of the nations, of the people, of the circumstances of this world. The book of Genesis has through it all a strand of personal responsibility. We are still responsible for our actions. God can use good actions and bad out, uh, uh, outcomes for good, but that doesn't mean that this world is a moral free-for-all when whatever we do comes out right in the end. Uh, there is still moral guidelines in how to live. Later we get the law through Moses and finally we see the law completed in our Lord Jesus. But these things are still 
both true that God is in control and we do have moral responsibility. We should do what's right and we can freely choose to do what's right. But our God can still use the mess that's caused by our wrongdoing for his glory. How does that apply in your life? Where for you today are good choices showing God's glory? And are there places where even bad things are being mended and being used for good? So even in this pandemic, which is a bad thing, how can God use bad things for good? We'll come back to that again next week in our final study when we come to chapter 50, where Joseph explicitly says similar things to this again. That's my first big theme that I see in this chapter. My second one I'll deal with a bit more quickly, because the second theme here is not about our actions and how God uses them, but God's action in salvation. My second big theme is not providence, but salvation. And we see that especially in verse seven, which where, where, where Joseph says, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. You can easily pass over that verse, but it's a very significant verse. Joseph says, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. That's an extraordinary statement. This is similar to the theme of providence, which is God making good out of bad. But this is different. This is affirming that God's heart is for the saving of his people. Joseph says of God that he doesn't just repair our mess, but he acts sovereignly to deliver his people. And the Old Testament is a series of stories of God's God delivering his people from destruction and preserving a remnant as his own. Just as that verse says, we see that in Noah. God preserving a remnant out of destruction. We see it various times in the life of Abraham as God chooses Abraham. We see it in the book of Esther, God preserving his people. We see it in the return from exile through Ezra and Nehemiah. As God preserves his remnant in exile and brings them back into the good land. And supremely, we see it in the, in, in the Passover story, in the Exodus as God preserves his people in Egypt and leads them out of Egypt into the promised land. And verse seven's comment that God is saving lives by a great deliverance is followed on into, in verse 18 by Pharaoh making an offer to the family to come into his land of plenty. It's a mirror image of what later will happen in the, the way the family's descendants leave Egypt. A great deliverance followed by an offer to come into a land of plenty. Except that this time, instead of going from Canaan into Egypt, they're going from Egypt back into Canaan, which becomes the land of Israel, where they came from. It's a mirror image, but the same story and almost the same words. And as Jewish people this week are celebrating Passover, we as Christians remember that event and also that it looks forward to the great deliverance that Jesus the Passover lamb brought for us as he bought on the cross our promised land of the new creation that we are being created for that we are being delivered into big themes of the bible that felt carry on through the old testament from from adam and eve from noah uh, right through now to in the Joseph story, through the Exodus, through the rest of the Old Testament, the return from exile and in Jesus on the cross, the fulfillment of the Passover. And here Pharaoh is the one who is offering them the promised land, the land of, uh, of that he is promising for them as a prefiguring of the promised land of Israel that they'll later go back into. It's extraordinary how this this parallel goes on. This story continues through the Bible. But here, this mirror image of going into Egypt and going out of Egypt that finds its fulfillment in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus that we are celebrating this week in this Easter week. Rest in that place today. It's not just something to put into your head. It's something to bear in your heart and to say, 
this is my God who has done this for me, who has won my deliverance on the cross and has promised for me a life now in Christ and a life to come in the presence of God, in his place of promise. Know that love and peace, peace and acceptance that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ as we also enter into his place of promise, which is a place of good things, a place not of famine, a place not of just getting by, but a place of fullness. I love the way these themes run through the Bible. And in this chapter, it just appears to us. Doreen's added some wisdom here. Let, let me read this to you. It says, Joseph forgives his brothers with God's help. Jesus forgives our sins as we come to him requesting it, then receiving that forgiveness washed in the blood of Jesus. Then we have to exercise that forgiveness to others. Yeah, that theme of forgiveness is certainly here as well, isn't it? That forgiving. Joseph offers his brothers forgiveness. And in that way, Joseph is, again, symbolic of Jesus himself who brings forgiveness. There's so much richness in these stories of relationships, sort of broken relationships and mended relationships, just as Christ, as Dorian says, offers us mended, reconciled, atoned relationships with God the Father. Thank you, Dorian. I wonder if anyone else has anything any other reflections to offer on this scripture? We've dealt with some big, big Bible themes today, but just, you know, it's good to know those things, but really we've just got to let it rest in our hearts as well and say, God loves me that much. God forgives me. God's providence can work in my life. So even when bad things happen, he can apply the goodness of God. <laughs> the wonder-working, repairing God of bad things into my life. I love that television programme, Repair Shop, where things come in broken and they leave made whole. <laughs> we can be like that in God's hands. We come into him broken so that we can be sent out made whole. God bless you today. We're getting towards the end of this story now. There's uh, three more sessions left. We're going to do the next two, two chapters at a time. And then we'll be finishing off with chapter 50. Uh, so we've got two chapters on Thursday, two more chapters next Tuesday. And then Tuesday of next week, we'll be finishing off with chapter 50. So read it, read ahead if you can and uh, give it some thought. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to just have a few minutes of prayer and then finish. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you act providentially in this world still, just as you brought things good for Joseph and his brothers and brought about forgiveness and reconciliation. And Joseph was sure that you'd done those things for good, not for harm. Lord, we pray that you will work the bad things of this world for good. And at the moment, we see so much sadness so much death, so much hurt in this world through this coronavirus. Lord, we want that sadness and badness to be brought for good by your providence. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting the loss of loved ones. I've just heard of several friends in the last few days have lost loved ones. I'm sure many of us joining us today are in that situation as well. Lord, bring your he healing and peace to those who are hurting. And we pray you'll bring healing to those who are unwell at the moment. Lord God, God of life, God of grace, bring healing. We pray for those who are coping with this current virus. We continue to pray for those who are working hard and giving their all and risking their own lives. Those who are on the front line in the NHS, those who are working behind the scenes in the health service and those who are 
helping to keep our, 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 our nation going in so many ways. Thank you for the bin men who came past our street this morning. Thank you for the shopkeepers who are keeping the, the nation provided with food and essentials. Thank you for the police on our streets. Thank you for the uh, the, the the administrators and the and the politicians and and all who are keeping um, the systems going. Thank you for so many people who are doing so much good for our nation. We thank you for our friends and family many of whom we're separated from at the moment, but we pray for them, Lord, and pray for those in need. In just a few seconds, to add our own personal prayers for those who are on our heart at the moment. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hello to those we haven't said hello to yet.